who actually want God to release something on them today, who don't mind opening their mouths and clapping their hands and asking God to pour a miracle out in their lives. Miracles, signs, wonders, release in our midst, oh God. We magnify you today and thank you for traveling mercy. Thank you for these who have ventured out to be here today. I want to thank you for the ability and the opportunity to get on an airplane and to travel and to get off again. It is your grace and mercy that has so blessed us. Today you are a prayer answering God. You're a mighty God. You're a forgiving God. You're a compassionate God. You're a loving God. And therefore, I'm not ashamed to magnify you and glorify you. Had it not been for you on my side, I have no idea where I would be today. But by your grace and mercy, I say thank you. Thank you for food and clothing, for shelter, for salvation, for so many blessings. Open our hearts and minds to a fresh revelation of your word today might be able to process it in our minds, living out in our lives. Later on, Lord, when we get ready to travel home, give us traveling mercy again, that we might make it safe there, hold off the snow just a little while, till we can get out and get home, and we'll give your name the praise. All of these blessings we ask in the marvelous, mighty, ineffable, unspeakable, never-ending, never-tiring name of Jesus. Somebody say praise God and amen. All right, go ahead and be seated. Glad you're here. Yeah, we bring you greetings from Florida. And some people were emailing me saying they were envious of us being in Florida. And I just let them know if it would be any help to them. It was cool in Florida. 60 and 65 and they said it didn't help them too much. We're glad to be able to have traveling mercy. And we thank God for those who stood in our stead, Pastor Butts, Minister Dennis, Minister Darren. Thank God for them. When I leave, I can leave you in good hands. You can get a message from the Word of God. In the fourth chapter of the book of Esther, Mordecai asked Esther a question that is altogether appropriate for this month in history. Y'all need to stand up. I ain't got no scripture for a long time. And that question is, and you don't need to stand up. Sit on down. Rest yourself. It's, it's cold outside. And the question is, and who knows whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this. And who knows whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this. And who knows whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this. I want to explore the question on four levels, ethnically, spiritually, ecclesiastically, and personally. So I don't know what none of them words mean. Just hang around. We'll help you. To explore the powerful question, we have to elucidate or expose the text and the context of the story of Esther. Esther is a romantic drama written as a short story, and yet it has all the marks of authentic history. The events described happened between the first return of the Israelites to the country under Zerubbabel and the second return under Ezra. The action takes place in and around Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire. The author nowhere refers to God in the book, nor does he mention Abraham, nor does he mention the covenant that God had with his people, nor does prayer come up nor does he deal with Davidic kingship. Esther is never quoted in the New Testament. 
and is the only Old Testament book not represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Go ahead and uh, touch somebody and say, that's more information than I want to know. I touch him on the other side and said, must be the bishop is back. Got issues. Yet the story contains a series of remarkable coincidences. Esther happened to be selected as Queen Vashti's successor. Mordecai, Esther's uncle, happened to uncover a plan to assassinate the king. King Ahasuerus happened to have insomnia on the night before Haman planned to kill Mordecai. And the section of the Royal Chronicles read that night to the king happened to contain the report of Mordecai's good deed. Though God is not mentioned, he is the central character of the book, more so than Esther, more so than Mordecai. And this makes the book of Esther extremely relevant for our day. For God is still sovereignly at work, saving his people. Think about it for a moment. Although to most modern Christians, God is more of an afterthought and is seldom mentioned when important decisions are made. I mean, we go on to buy the car and by the time we got the car, we praying that God would bless what we done done but we don't consult him as the center of all that we are doing. Yet God is sovereignly at work behind the scenes. He's standing right there, hidden in plain sight, and people can't see him. Similar to his role in the book of Ruth. You ought to be able to figure out sometime in your life that when there is coincidence after coincidence after coincidence, that maybe there's some divine providence somewhere. That God must be up to something. I don't think we have figured it out yet that when there is coincidence after coincidence in your life that God is moving in a way, we just uh, chalk it up to luck. And I'm so glad to know that I ain't lucky. I'm blessed. When God opens certain doors and does certain things, and you know that it, it, it just happens and there's a whole lot of stuff coming together, God just might be involved. So, not so much that it's luck, but it's divine providence. Now, this is going to be a very difficult sermon today. So, and, and so touch your neighbor and say, difficult sermon. Difficult. Now, touch him again and say, difficult already because I done touched you two times. That's difficult. <laughs> it's already difficult. Now, luck plays a part, more of a role in our lives of those than we think those of us who are deterministic. Determinism is the belief that God has caused every action and free will means very little. The writer of the Ecclesiastes wrote in Ecclesiastes 9-11, I saw again under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors and neither is bread to the wise nor wealth to the discerning nor favor to men of ability but time and chance overtake them all. Now, there are those who will argue that the writer of the Ecclesiastes is depressed or burned out. Nevertheless, his evaluation is inscripturated for us, recorded in the scripture of the word of God. Time and chance happen to us all. God does not determine everything that flows into our lives. Some stuff is the product of human choice, time, and chance. God gave us free will, and our choices and our time and our chance coincide in certain events. 
Yet God is always involved in history, and he's in the final control of history, although he does not choose to be involved minutely in each event, because when he gave you free will, he gave you that choice. So particularly in the life of a Christian, Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God calls us all things. Well, don't stop right there. Keep reading. To work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God doesn't cause all things, but rather he calls all things to work together. How? For good. To who? To those who love God. You can, God can take any situation and work it together with all of the circumstances for our ultimate good and his ultimate purpose. Now, I did not say it would be good like you like it. I did not say it would be your particular choice of good. He said for good. And so this has caused lots of problems. I'm going to work with it deeply today. God may not have caused your automobile accident, but he can work something out of it for your good. God may not have caused you to marry your maid. But he can work something out of your marriage for your good. That'll help those of y'all who, you know, God made me do something. He done made me marry somebody and, and now uh, you can just stop that foolishness. You had a choice, and you made a choice. And then somebody will tell me, but I did it because God told me. Now, you want, you, do I look that gullible? It's like you do everything God say. When it doesn't work the way you want to, you say, I don't think that's God. God may not have caused you to be laid off, but he can cause the layoff to work together. What? For good. In the light of Black History Month, there's a greater question I want to work with for two Sundays. Did God cause us to be captured in Africa, ferried across the Atlantic, be horribly treated and enslaved, exposed to Jim Crow, Jim Crow segregation, hyper-ghettoized, and imprisoned? I believe many of you here who are deterministic, you're deterministic Christians, I believe you would answer yes. I believe you would answer God caused us to be brought from Africa to here. That's my belief. Uh, I have a friend that's sent me a program. We may try it out one day. It's a program that will allow you to take your cell phone and vote on certain things and then put the results up on the screen because I'd like to vote on that one. I like to see where y'all really are. But since you ain't got no vote, I'm going to speak for you. I believe that's what you would say. God brought us here. But you're deterministic. If you're deterministic, you believe God determined everything. That's what you would say. And you would even say more than that. You would say yes, decidedly, if you understood how Christianity was involved in the beginning of the slave trade. So let me give you a little history before I go forward. The 15th century Portuguese exploration of the African coast is commonly regarded as the foreshadow of European colonialism. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V issued the papal bull Dum de Versus, granting Alfonso V of Portugal the right to reduce any Saracens, pagan, and any other believers to hereditary slavery, which legitimized the slave trade under Catholic beliefs of that time. A papal, papal bull is a formal declaration from the Pope that has his bulla or seal attached to it. This approval of slavery was reaffirmed and extended in his Romanus Pontifex Bull of 1455. These papal bulls came to serve as a justification for the subsequent era of slave trade and European colonialism. So slavery was legitimized by the Roman Catholic Church. 
For a short period, in 1462, Pius II declared, slavery to be a great crime crime and the followers of the church of england and protestants did not use the papal bull as a justification the church did condemn the slavery of christians but slavery was generally regarded as the oldest established necessary institution which supplied europe with its necessary workforce consequently the ritual surrounding the, sla the sale of slaves was deeply christian christian in ways that were obvious to those who looked on the first slaves were so and a christian would be to us also Prince Henry had a royal chronicler by the name of Zerara. Zerara is a storyteller that gives us the insight into the Christian perspective that undergirded the despicable enslaving of Africans. Here is a telling action that Zerara records. Welcome to the House Prince of the Lord Henry Games. ordered a tithe be given to God through the church. A tithe of what? Slaves. We got some slaves we brought here. We're going to tithe. We're going to give a tenth of them to the church. Furthermore, Prince Henry claimed his motivation for enslaving the African was for the salvation of the soul of the heathen. Some would certainly say today that God determined all of this, but did he? Before I give you my answer, I need to look a little more at the story of Esther because it will be the basis for my answer. So let's summarize the main action of the story. Uh, breathe. Go ahead. Breathe. You all right? Okay. Just giving you history so you know what's going on. Haman is livid that Mordecai won't bow down to him. He hatches, he hatches a plan to kill Mordecai and his people, the Jews. Esther is the only one who has access to the king, but the king hasn't sent for her in some time. And if she approaches the king and he doesn't extend the scepter to her, she will be executed. Mordecai urges Esther to go to the king. Take me to the king. I don't have much. They don't know what they're singing about. It sounds good. It's a nice song. But if you go to the king and the king don't extend the scepter, you'll get your head cut off. He says, go and reveal your identity now, that you are Jewish, and plead for the lives of your people. And Esther said, uh-uh. That's, you have to, that's the modern African-American interpretation. Uh-uh. I ain't going in there because she knows if she goes and he doesn't extend the scepter, she's dead. But she is convinced by Mordecai to risk her life for her people by the penetrating words that Mordecai spoke in Esther 4.14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this. I, I can't resist giving a little commentary out the gate, and I'm going to go back and I'll come back. God's favor is never meant to be squandered in selfish indulgence. I said God's favor is never meant to be squandered in selfish indulgence. Achieving God's purpose for our existence is more important than personal comfort. And her resolve rings in the words, if I perish, I perish. Now, notice I ain't getting a lot of amens. This, the first crowd, I was getting a whole lot more amens. This is the younger folks crowd over here. I ain't talking about giving my life for nobody and finding what God want me to do. And I want my rights. But God didn't bless you like he did. So you can walk around and say, I'm blessed. Mordecai says, who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. And so, in the Baptist tradition, I like to use for a subject this morning. For such a time as this. I said, I like to use for a subject. For such a time as this. That's going to take me about five weeks to work through till we get to the anniversary. It really would take me 25 sermons to do this, but I know you can't handle that. 
or I cut it down to five. Who knows whether you've been called to the kingdom, achieved royalty for such a time as this. God's favor is to be providentially used to advance his reign. All right, I want to look at this truth ethnically, spiritually, ecclesiastically, and personally. All right, back to the question. Did God cause us to be captured in Africa, ferried across the Atlantic, to be horribly, horribly treated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Since I believe most people are going to have trouble with my answer, I'm going to have to give any number of reasons to support that answer, and I'm going to have to preach deductively and give my answer up front. No, I do not believe God caused us to be captured in Africa, ferried across the Atlantic, or be horribly treated. No, I do not believe that. Before we go any further, I need to deal with another question that's in heavily impinging upon that one. Do I believe that God allowed it? Y'all not like the first service. First service, they was giving me all the answers. Y'all sitting on me, just looking at me. And they said, yes, I believe God allowed it. And then I had to work with them a little bit. That's a very misunderstood question. Because many brands of Christianity are deterministic. That is, they believe that God determines everything. Therefore, everything that happens must be personally allowed by God. If he determined everything, then he must allow everything. Uh, but that's not really true. I don't, think, I don't think it is. You know, as I was doing this sermon, I started thinking, there's some people who are going to be mad at me. They're not going to agree with me. They probably want to kick me out. This, but what can they do to me? I'll be 63 in March. You want to send me to an early retirement? No, I don't believe that. Let me give you an example. Let's work on it a little bit. Now, you're going to have to think this morning and ask God for revelation. So you're going to think about it. I know that for a lot of folks, they don't, they don't have to think in church. You're going to have to think, and then you're going to have to get some revelation. Let's work. Y'all ready to go? Hello, y'all ready to go? Okay, the 25 of y'all who are ready... And then the other 25 who said it louder, yes! I decided to jump off the Empire State Building. Does God have to personally allow me to go down? Think about it now. No, he doesn't have to do that. Why? Because there's a process called gravity, which will take me down most of the time. All the time, every time, in reality, when God created gravity, he already allowed for any number of eventualities. So therefore, when you jump off the Empire State Building, God then personally in heaven doesn't have to say, oh, wait a minute, okay, I allow you to fall. When you start talking about momentum or whatever, the only one way you won't fall is because you have some momentum when you will run and jump, and that momentum will keep you going for a little while, and then you're going down. Every time. It's called gravity, so God doesn't have to allow that. All right. That didn't, that didn't quite do it, did it? I'll give you another one. Give you another one. We're, we're working today. A fertile man has sex with a fertile woman. Does God have to personally allow a pregnancy? Be careful now because I know what you've been taught and I know what you believe. Does God have to allow a pregnancy? I don't think he does. I think there's a thing that he created called reproduction. That if you are fertile and the other person is fertile, that there's a certain amount of things that they will take care of themselves and if, the, if the, the circumstances are right, if time and chance is right, you'll be pregnant. God doesn't have to say, I'm going to allow you to have a baby. After certain choices are made, time and chance automatically happen. Jesus actually teaches this in the Bible. You just don't know it because it has never been brought out. I'm going to bring it out for you today. He talks about automa the automatisms of the world system. Mark 4.26. And he was saying the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil and goes to bed at night and gets up by day. 
And the seed sprouts up and the grows and how he himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The soil produces the crop, how? By itself. It is a part of what we would call nature. God doesn't have to personally allow each crop to grow. He states that the soil produces crops by itself. The Greek word is a word I think you will, you, you, you'll recognize. It is automatos. Have you heard of that word before? We get the word what? Automatic from it. The, the word in the Greek means acting on one's own will or of its own accord. Literally translated automatic. The ground grows stuff automatically. So Mark is talking about growth automatism. And of course, from a biblical perspective, this automatism would never be attributed to the false God we call Mother Nature. But behind such things is God himself. Even if these things happen by themselves, God is the one who set them in motion. There is no mother nature behind what God has done. So even though God is not the author of many things in the world, he created the processes that stand behind them and is always involved in history, although not always directly involved in miraculous ways. So although God will never contravene gravity, he will never stop it. You're never going to jump off anything and levitate. If you jump, what? You're going down. But he may intervene and save your life. You may jump off the Empire State Building and hit 13, oh, it's a long way down, 52 awnings on the way down and break your fall and you live. He didn't stop gravity, but guess what? He was involved and saved your life. I'm talking about if you're saved. If you're unsaved, what? Time and chance happen to us all. Although God will not directly stop you from having sex with the wrong person, he may intercede to bring about a number of different outcomes because he's God and you're his child. Although God will not take away your freedom of choice, he may intervene in different ways to bring about different results in things that are going on because he's in our life. He doesn't have to allow consequences to ensue directly the way we think they ought to because he is God, we are his children, and he cares about us. Now, if you're unsaved, that's another whole problem. But even when you're saved, sometimes time and chance happen to us all, but then God can intercede. So, so we don't have to, this, I mean, this is so good, because when you think through it, you don't have to blame God for negative things that flow into our lives as a result of our own choices or the choices somebody else made. Let me try that on, let's try it on for size so you can get it. I do, I do many funerals. I've done many over the years. You interact with folks, and here's a woman that's standing there. Uh, somebody ran over her little three-year-old daughter, and then somebody gets up in the church and says, God took her daughter. Now you got to deal with, she's supposed to love God, thank God, and shout about it. She ain't shouting about it. And I'm not either, because I don't believe God did that. But then she's Christian, so she's deterministic and serious. Maybe God took my daughter, because I've been having an affair. Maybe God took my daughter, because I've been stealing at work. Maybe God, no, 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 baby, no, 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 no. If God want to get you, he can get you. He don't need to get your daughter. He don't need to get the person sitting next to you. He has directive power. He can strike down somebody right next to you and they don't even touch you. If he wants you, he can get you. He ain't taking your daughter. That's a part of life. Stuff happens in life. I don't choose to run into somebody and have an automobile accident. I merely choose to drive. However, somebody else chooses to drive drunk. God didn't determine, he doesn't cause, he doesn't choose for them to run into me. He didn't even have to allow it. These things are allowed in the context of called driving. Every time you get in your car, you are in danger, whether you realize it or not. 
Now, because of who I am, I prefer to drive rather than fly. I just came back from flying. And I don't like flying, even though they tell me, they quote the statistics to me, it's much safer to fly than it is to drive. And I say, thank you, but I'd rather drive than fly. Because I feel more in control. I got my hands on the wheel. It may be uh, an illusion, but that's what it feels like. And when I wreck, I don't fall 34,000 feet. <laughs> when I wreck, I'm going to be tough, going to be bad, but it's going to be right here on the ground. That's driving. If you allow yourself to do that, then those are the eventuality. Okay, let's deal with this a little bit more and I can go on. So therefore, we're dealing, are y'all all, all right? So we're dealing with this stuff because people, well, I think God determines, he determines what's going to, he's the one, okay, there's a difference in God and then he allows it. He allows it to take place. So that's the same as he determined. It's not the same. Let's talk about allow and determine for a minute. Every time you allow your children to go to school, you allow the eventuality that somebody may hit them by a car and run them over. That's what you allow. That's different than you getting in the car, going up there and running them over on purpose. It's not the same thing. God allows it in the context of, we allow it in the context of making those decisions. Furthermore, there is something that God has determined. He has determined some stuff now. I'm not saying he hasn't determined anything. He has. And I'm not saying that he doesn't determine anything. I'm saying he does, but we don't know necessarily what they are. But I can tell you the stuff he does determine and promise, and you don't like it. You want one of them? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Lo, I am with you through all kinds of days. The word always there means all kinds of days, dark days, distressing days, despairing days, difficult days. I'm always there. I promise you that no matter what you go through, I will be there with you. Now, when you look around, because we're in the book of Esther, you can't see him. You don't know that he's there. And yet, if you opened your eyes and you could see in the spirit, you would know that you are here and that he was with you because you wouldn't have made it without him. Here you are, you done been driving, and you swung, closed your eyes because you knew you were going to have an accident, woke up beyond the car and tried to figure out what happened. Do you think God might have been in it somewhere? <laughs> Stuff going all, all around you, folks dying or whatever, never hits you, you never get sick. Do you think God might have been in it anywhere? Do you think God is in any of that stuff where he works in your life over and over and over again? <laughs> I'll work on that in a minute. So, no, I don't believe that God determined our slavery, Jim Crow segregation, hyper-ghettoization, imprisonment. I don't believe he caused any of that, but I believe he can cause it to work together for our ultimate good and for our immediate and ultimate purposes that he has. Now, I'm going in real deep now. Tell somebody say he's going deeper even. There is some good that God has brought out of our being enslaved and being brought here. I didn't think I was going to get a good reception on that, and I was right. And then some people ask, what good would that be? Let me give you one. One good would be that even though we lag behind whites in every indicator of wealth, we are far wealthier than the vast majority of the world. We are wealthy and don't know it. You say, I, I don't feel like, well, you're looking at the wrong indicator. If you look at the majority of, of, the, of the American society or you look at white middle class, you might say, well, therefore, I'm not real wealthy. But if you look at the rest of the world, you will find out that you are incredibly wealthy. And if you don't think so, let me take your wealth and drop you back in Africa where you came from. So you can find out whether you are wealthy or not. That's a result of being in America. Now, remember what I said. I don't think God sent us here. I don't think God organized it, orchestrated it. I think it's a matter of choice, chance, time, all of those things. But he can work it out. I'm going to give you another one. This is going to be the deep one right now. This, I, I guess it's about as deep as I can go today. 
He said, what, what other purposes would you have? There is, God can use, mm, 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 mm. should I say this? I, I don't know, because y'all, I don't know. Y'all ain't looking at me right. God can use our horrific treatment and struggle for his purposes. Um, faint-hearted applause. Thank you, though. I appreciate even the faint-hearted. He can use our ugly treatment and our struggle for his purposes. Mm, mm, mm. I'm going to preach about that uh, a little later on. But right now, let me just, from a negative, that's from a negative perspective. Let me go to the opposite for a moment, which corresponds to uh, Esther. There are times when it seems that God intervenes and blesses his children with particularly advantageous circumstances. You got a job that God intervened and blessed you with. Let me tell my story, since you can't shout about yours. When I was working at the Babcock and Wilcox Company in material and inventory control, attending the University of Akron, a job came open that I wanted to have. And that said that a requirement is that you must have a bachelor's degree. And I didn't have one. So I went to apply for the job and people were telling me, ain't no use in implying, applying you ain't got no degree. I said, no, I don't have a degree, but I know somebody who's above all degrees. If I was Baptist this morning, I'd say, I know a man from Galilee. If you in sin, he'll set you free. Do you know him? So I don't have time to tell the whole story this morning. Y'all making me go long. All I can tell you is I got the job. I'm the only person I know of who got a job in, in, in personnel in equal employment opportunity without a degree at the Babcock and Wilcock because God can take the heart of a man and turn it like he wants. He can change circumstances and cause things to happen the way he wants them to happen. Mm. You got a job and God was in the process. You got a house and God was in the midst. You know you shouldn't have got that house, but God worked some stuff out. You got a car and got favor when you weren't supposed to get the car and, the, and God got in the person and they gave you some little deal. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let me tell another story while I'm here. Don't rush me. We got communion and then you going home. Don't rush me. When we were building this building, and I looked and saw, was riding somewhere for a particular occasion, came across a place where there was some land being sold, and I'd always wanted to build a house. I, I, I just have this issue with taking stuff that other people have used. I just me. So I, we, I wanted to build, like we built this, you know. But anyway. And God said, as I was preaching during this particular series, he said to Solomon, now that you have built your house, my house, you may build your house. And I said, God, are you talking to me? Are you trying to tell me something? And I went on down and started to investigate and look at the house and it's going to be brand new. And I went home, talked to my wife. We, we can't afford that. I ain't got no down payment for I was Well, God, if you was talking to me, you're going to have to work something out. Because this ain't going to work. Not on the salary I'm on. Not on what I see. So we went over there and we did a little talking. And the man said, uh, oh, yeah, we work it, we work it out. We're going we're to give you a bridge loan. And I said, time out. What is a bridge loan? He said, a bridge loan will afford you the ability to take the equity in your current home, bridge it over to the new house, and then we will make a swap. 
I said, well, do your thing, Jesus. Go ahead. Now, just, just go ahead and do what you want to do. Whatever you're doing in this season, just do what you want to do, but don't do it without me. Well, just go, go ahead then. You, you're up to something. I'm saying, wait a minute now. Wait, no, wait a minute. Time out. Time out, time out, time out. Uh, how come I ain't never heard of no bridge loan up to this moment? And there are two reasons. One reason is it wasn't the time. For who knows whether you have for such a time as this. Number two, when you're black, they don't give bridge loans to black people. <laughs> unless you come up to a certain level of economic standing. Don't be mentioned, so if you go over there in the ghetto talking about, you know, have you ever heard of bridge loan? I'll be praying for you. You got a job, you got a car, you got a mate. You got some stuff you ought not to have, but God <laughs> interceded for you and you're blessed. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, Y'all got to get all the shout now now because I'm getting ready to stop it all in, one, in the next statement. Get all the shout now now because what I'm going to say next is going to kill all that shouting. So when that occurred and you are a part of God's kingdom, the question you ought to ask yourself is who knows whether we have attained this blessing for such a time as this? Who knows whether you got a job in America right now for such a time as this? Everybody around you getting laid off, your job secure. Maybe God wants to use something. you whether you've been blessed with a house for such a time as this. There's some people in your family that are hurting, they've lost their home, and you have already quoted the, 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 your uh, religious perspective to them, God bless the child that's got his own. But maybe you ought to ask yourself a question, who knows whether I have a house right now? For such a time as this. Who knows whether I've been blessed with a car for such a time as this? Who knows whether I've been blessed with a position of influence for such a time as this? Please indulge me. Please indulge me this morning as I attempt to ask this question. Who knows whether we've been brought from Africa to America for such a time as this? Now I know that that question seems to be misapplied because being brought to America has nothing advantageous about it. However, I already mentioned one advantage, and that is the advantage of wealth. But there are other blessings that can be intuited if you look just below the surface. One of those, oh God, here we go again, I got to say something difficult. <clears throat> Well, God bless you. Let's go home. What's the problem? I already know what I'm going to say. Well, you wasn't saying amen. You don't act like you want to hear it. Then I close up the book. Now, uh, 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 uh. One of the hidden blessings is the experience of surviving unimaginable sufferings. I'm going to have to say that about 30 times. One of the hidden blessings is the experience of surviving unimaginable sufferings. Now, y'all messed up. Now, where's the blessing in that? Where, where do I, of course, most materialistic, free market, uh, rights-oriented African-American and whites would not consider surviving suffering a blessing or an advantage. Please allow me to, to counter-culturally state that we, what we have learned from these circumstances is a great advantage. Now, I'm going to holler a little bit and I'm going to close it up and go home. 
Because some of y'all are saying, hey, what's, what's the advantage of that? Let me, let me try to help you here. Let me, let me, let me, let me you, you ask me now. Let me answer, let me answer. Because of suffering, we are more religious. Yeah. African American people are religious people. And one reason you're religious is because when you have suffered enough, you get rid of all of that agnostic, atheistic, all of that gold. When you suffered enough, now, when you're not suffering, you can, you, and you got plenty of money, and you got plenty of food, and all like that, then you have the ability and the time and the audacity to be talking about, is there a God or not? I'm not sure I really believe in the concept of God. You know, perhaps there is a God, or perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm not really atheistic, I'm more agnostic. I doubt the existence of God. Not saying that there is no God, but you know, yeah, you can talk that stuff when you got food in your mouth, gas in your car, clothes on your back. But when you in the bowels of a ship being transported from one culture to another, and you've completely lost contact with where you are on the earth and every place else, and you gotta call for some help somewhere, and you begin to know that there must be a God somewhere that can help me right now. Hallelujah, I feel like preaching, but I can't right now. When you're down in trouble, and you don't have anything, and the only reason you are alive is because there is something inside of you springing up in the everlasting life. Glory to God. I'm just preaching to real folks right now. I'm not preaching to the folks who ain't always know you always got everything going on. Everything is like you like it. I'm preaching to folks who have some difficult time. When you have to look around and wonder if I was going to lose my mind. But God, I said, but God. Worked some stuff out and got me out of where I was. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Woo, glory. I'm sorry, this is not the preacher part. Let me stop. <laughs> Suffering will make you take life more seriously. When you've been through something, you don't take life so frivolously. When you've been down and out, when you've been in jail, when you've been hungry, when you had to make, barely make it, you, you don't take it so lightly. Most of the modern folks, they, they take it like they take it because they never had hard times. When you never had hard times, then you, if that's a different thing. You can walk down on the back of shoes and do all kinds of stuff like that when you ain't never had to pay for them and it ain't. But when you just to live and, and, and your mama just have to put some beans out there and y'all just split up the beans, that makes a difference. Suffering will make you value life differently. When you've been through some stuff, that's why some of you, I'm trying to make sure that you don't try to jump out of your suffering. Stay right there in your suffering a little bit. Don't end it just yet. God might be trying to teach you something right there. And when you learn what you need to learn there, you, come, you become somebody else. Hallelujah. Why do you think, I know you don't get it, why do you think people want to hang around me and like me so much and, ooh, Bishop, I, I just want to hang with you. You think it's some kind of popularity thing. No, it's because there's life inside of me. And the life inside of me comes out of persecution and pain and difficulty and struggle and working through so that I become a living person so there's something inside of me springing up in an everlasting life. You said they, they don't like me. They don't want to be my friend. Why don't you be a friend? He that would be friendly, but my friend must first show himself friendly. Maybe because you ain't no friend, you ain't got no friends. But when you have suffered something, when you have gone through, when you have been through, suffering teaches you something. When you have, I'm talking about the advantages now, suffering will teach you how to survive. I got so many of y'all, I'm going to turn around so you won't think I'm looking at you. I got so many of these little, little modern little saints who want to quit every time little something happened to them. 
Suffering will teach you how to survive. You learn how to survive when folks don't like you. You learn how to survive when things aren't going well. You learn how to survive. How did we make it to where we are with the attitudes we got now? Because we didn't have it. We knew that, that, that however bad it was at work, however bad it was that was going on over here, however bad it was at church, if I could get home and just get me a little cornbread and slap some Vaseline on my head and make it out to the house of God and go over there and shout for a while that everything was going to be all right because God would help me to survive whatever I needed to survive. Take me through, dear Lord, take me through, and I'll do what you want me to do. Take me through. I don't want to go around, I don't want to go over, I don't want to go above, but I got to go through, through the heartache, through the difficulty, through the trial, through the pain. I got to go through. Teach you how to survive. All our young people who want to quit every time the team don't do what you want it to do. Every time you run into difficulty at school. All y'all basketball football, baseball player, because the coach demotes you. Then I quit. George Sweeting said any fool can quit. <laughs> Quitting proves nothing. Can you persevere? Can you go through? Can you make it when folks are standing against you? Oh, I love it. That's what I'm getting ready to show my Jesus. When I can walk up to them and I know what they said about me and I know how they talked about me and I know they've been shared it all over the church and I can grab them and hug them and say, how you baby, love you so good. And then now nah, they, they know what they said. I know what they said. But I got Jesus down on the inside. He told me to love even my enemy. I can love you. I ain't done nothing to you. I love you just like you are. Love you just the way you are. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Suffering will teach you certain intangible things about life. There's some stuff in life that goes real deep you can't learn until you go through. You can't get this at school. They don't teach it at the University of Akron. It is not a, it is, it is, it does, you can't be taught in the furtherance of the school system. It is not academia. You cannot learn it except you go through. That's the reason your mama was smarter than you even though you got a PhD. You didn't get it. You didn't get that, did you? You, you didn't get that, did you? you? You didn't get that. Because, you know, well, I, you know, I have my PhD, yeah. But the problem is your mama know how to pray heaven down. And because she did, she knows some stuff about life that you'll never learn at the school level. Nothing wrong with school. Go to school. Get smart. But also get wise. Everybody who's smart ain't wise. So I'm going to argue that the particular place we occupy, African Americans in America, should be viewed as a place of advantage and influence. And who knows whether we've arrived at this position of influence for such a time as this. Hold on to your seat. Grab your seat because I'm getting ready to say it and I'm going to have to run. I believe God has and continues to use African American people to change the course of the character and to change the course of America. Who knows whether we are at this point. For such a time as this, I believe it is our finest hour. I believe America is waiting on us to step up and show them this is how you live. This is what love is all about. These are the important values. Poor, this is how you help poor people. This is what you do. In the light of this belief and these lessons of suffering, what exactly do African American people bring to America? And how do we believe God wants to use us in America? That answer is far ranging. And I'll attempt to answer it next week. <laughs> Previews. 
of coming attractions. So you don't want to miss next Sunday when I finish up the ethnic perspective of this question. And then I'll move on to the spiritual aspects, the ecclesiastical aspects, and the personal aspects. But who knows whether you have attained influence for such a time as this. Bow your head, please. I would ask you to close your eyes. They're preparing for communion right now. If you do not know Jesus and you want to know him, would you pray with me right now and say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for every sin that I've sinned against you. Come in my life. Save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for giving me eternal life. I receive you as Savior and Lord. If you prayed that prayer in a minute, you all know how happy I am for you. So in a little while, we're going to take communion. Just take the elements, and you'll be able to signify and to testify about what you've done by taking that communion. If you believe that God has led you here to be a member, then you can take communion and you will signify in that same way. The rest of us ought to be praying, Lord, show me my blessings. Show me what you want me to do for such a time as this. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, even though you didn't cause all my circumstances. Huh, glory. You can use them. And you have used them. And you will continue to use them. And so, I thank you, not necessarily for what happened, but because you're working out some stuff because of what happened. And then in your word, you said we can come to a point where in all things we can give thanks, knowing that ultimately you'll work it out for our good. What a mighty God you are. And so as we prepare to take communion today, Lord, if there's anything in our lives that's not like you, we do confess right now. Say that you are right, we are wrong, and we want you to forgive us. We repent. For this cause, a number have taken communion unworthily with unconfessed sin in their lives. And Lord, you said because of that, some are weak, some are sick, some are even asleep or dead. But all we need to do is just say, forgive us. And you are forgiving God. So forgive us right now as we prepare to take your communion. And let your death, burial, and resurrection be proclaimed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The